Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wen, and I'm the CEO of Smarking. Uh, we are a technology company based here in San Francisco, uh, working with many great municip municipalities like uh, who we have today, Santa Monica, Houston, Miami, and many others, as well as parking operators and the commercial real estate owners to help them to extract value uh, out of their own parking data. Um, today, we work with just north of 2,000 parking sites across North America. And we're very fortunate today to have a world-class panel uh, with uh, Henry Serving, the director of IT from the uh, 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 city of Miami, Miami Parking Authority. And um, we have another Henry. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mixed up this myself. <laughs> My apologies. Henry Serving, uh, the parking manager from the city of Santa Monica. Um, uh, you can see him on the uh, camera. Uh, still working in the office today. Um, mm -hmm. We have Norman Holt and uh, Rami uh, Afarat uh, from uh, the city of Houston. And we have uh, Henry uh, Espinosa uh, from Mi Miami Parking Authority. Um, so uh, what we will do today is um, we'll let everybody uh, quickly share about uh, their background and then talk a little bit about the new reality as the, the, the first uh, uh, part of our panel session. And then we'll let panelists share uh, with uh, the audience on their thinking and their actions on the replanning and recovery, fighting against the COVID-19 situation. And everyone would also share their um, concluding thoughts after that. And then we'll open the floor to the audience to ask any questions you may have. Um, with that being said, I'll uh, uh, hand the mic to um, Serving uh, uh, from City of Santa Monica. Um, and then, uh, uh, to get the introduction going, uh, please. Thank you very much, Wen. It's a real pleasure to be here with everyone. I hope you're keeping safe and healthy and uh, you know, planning for a quick recovery. I think uh, all of us in the parking industry realize that it's, it's a key component and an essential service of what we do. And once the economy starts to roar back, they're gonna rely on us to be in the background and ready to staff up and deploy again. So we can't we can't even lose downtime now. Uh, uh, the reason that uh, we're involved in this seminar is to uh, uh, illustrate with you and for you how uh, we've used large amounts of data aggregated properly to be able to tell our story. City of Santa Monica provides 36,000 public parking spaces uh, for a town of about 92,000 population. It's really quite something. We're the, uh, the beach, uh, nearest beach access for the city of Los Angeles. Um, we, on any typical summer day, grow to 350,000 people in the town. Um, about half of our 36,000 public spaces are located along 18 beach lots, uh, surface lots that are in size anywhere from several thousand spaces down to about 40. Um, at any given time, we're having to open and close these lots. We're looking at our real-time sensors and then looking at our year-over-year -year data that we've had with Smarking to be able to predict with some degree of certainty how we're uh, parceling out our, uh, our uh, beach lots. Uh, we have uh, used the Smarking database to help inform our city council how we should keep the uh, organization moving forward. Um, even during these times with the coronavirus, we're, we're running anywhere from 5% to 20% of capacity, which is pretty impressive uh, in the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of businesses open. Uh, we, the governor of California, has officially closed all the beaches and parks, so we do not allow people to park in the parking lots. Um, so it's, it's a matter of how, um, how clever can we be with our data. Uh, knowing that uh, you know, we, we have a large staff. SP Plus is our contractor that manages our, our facilities, both in downtown and in the beach zone. We have to be able to, um, within a, a week's notice, uh, pivot so that we can either uh, hold staff back or bring more staff forward to where we need to be. Um, the city of Santa Monica is divided into two major groupings for our parking. We have our downtown operations, which operates 13 structures. Um, that's a, a total of about 6,000 parking spaces across that. And then we have our beach lots that I previously mentioned, and that's its own operation. In addition to that, we also administer the parking meters across town uh, with city staff, and those are patrolled by a branch of our Santa Monica Police Department. The, um, 
the nice thing about the SmartKing platform is that it pretty much integrates all of our users. So it doesn't matter if I have a two, T2 machine on the beach or my ski data um, sentry system in the, in the downtown or even my IPS meters all over town, um, I can see them all on my platform. I'm actually looking at my platform on the, on the right screen that you can't see now, but uh, it's giving me my data um, on a pretty um, close to you know, reality basis. And then I can always just show a year over year. I'll stop right there and uh, just, just saying I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk some more about where we're going in the future, but I'd like to give a moment for the other speakers. Appreciate the intro, uh, Harry. Um, and Rami and uh, Holt from uh, Houston will let you go um, on a uh, introduction of your operations yourself. Hi everyone, uh, this is Rami. Um, myself and my colleague uh, Norman Holt are on the line. We're happy to join today and kind of give you some uh, feedback about what our experience has been so far. But let me start by saying that um, obviously the city is the fourth largest uh, municipality in the U.S. We cover um, about 680 square miles of space, uh, manage about uh, 9,000 on-street meter spaces. We have about 1,000 smart meters deployed. Um, they're all, I believe, uh, T2 Luke machines. Mm. Um, and obviously, we, we engaged with SmartKing about a year, year and a half ago. And our effort with them really started um, as a way for us to um, gather all the meter data that we have and make sense of it um, on a daily basis so that way we can start using that data to make business decisions. Uh, so far, I can tell you that this has been a, a, a good success. Uh, we are engaged with them. Uh, and, and as far as this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, issue is concerned, Obviously, the drop for us here in the city began really on the 9th of March. Mm. That's when we began to see declines in business transactions. Um, just volumes began going down rapidly. To give you an idea um, of our production, we produce about 200 or issue about 200,000 citations a year. Mm. Um, over 2,000 boots are placed on vehicles. Um, and so it's a large operation. We've got about 35 officers that are patrolling those 680 square miles of the city. Um, but right now, obviously, with the drop in, in uh, residents being out on the street and businesses in the downtown um, area, we have seen a huge, huge drop um, in, in it really everything. It's just across the board, everything is down. And so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, uh, I just thank you very much for the introduction. Would definitely love to get more into the details uh, shortly, uh, and uh, would love to let um, uh, Mr. Espinosa from Miami Parking Authority give us a quick intro on his operations, his focus day to day as well. Uh, yeah, hi. So uh, I'm the IT director for the Miami Parking Authority. Uh, we uh, run. Uh, about uh, right now five garages soon to be six uh, we have about 75 service surface lots about 45,000 spaces throughout the city of Miami um, uh, we're, we're part of we're actually a uh, an independent agency of the city of Miami uh, so we're, we're in charge of uh, all of the, uh, the the parking resources down here we have approximately 60 uh, enforcement officers that, that handle our day-to-day uh, enforcement and then a variety of other staff, roughly 170 um, uh, area. Um, we started with with smarking. Um, what is it now? When uh, five years ago, -ish, oh. six maybe. 2015. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's been uh, it's been quite some time. Uh, and and for us, one of one of the big challenges that we had um, when when we engaged smarking was that we had four separate revenue control systems uh and then we had pay by phone mm -hmm. and then we still had our on-street uh, parking machines and so trying to get a picture of you know what each one of our garages was doing independently with different reporting systems and all that was was just a complete nightmare so we dumped everything into one place and um and that's kind of what we use now to keep our, our finger on the pulse of what's going on uh and then obviously for this you know for this crisis it's, it's been fantastic for us from the perspective that we can you know, I mean, within within 30 seconds, you log in and you immediately know. Like, I know that we're already 85% off of where we were last year, uh, and, and I don't even have to dig around too much 
for that when uh, this, this entire crisis also happened to hit um, like the week after we uh, we appointed a new CEO. Um, and so she's obviously, you know, trying to move into a new position. She was with us before. She's, she's very well um, uh, versed in, in, in our operations, but obviously that's a big step for somebody to take and then to have to deal with a crisis like this. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't imagine how, uh, how stressful that much be, must be. To, so to have this kind of information at her fingertips when she has to turn around and report to the city um, is critical for her. One of the things that, that, that makes this a very uh, kind of high stakes game for us is that we are one of the few uh, revenue streams for, for the city. Obviously, you have your property taxes and that kind of stuff. But other than that, you have a lot of cost centers. Fire is a cost center. Police is a cost center. Uh, and, and so, um, so when they're looking at us to provide revenue to them, uh, they're spending, you know, much more than they're normally accustomed to, uh, to try to deal with this crisis. Uh, and at the same time, they're losing revenue from, from all, uh, from many of their other sources. They're looking at us. And so we need to be, to be able to make sure that we provide, uh, accurate information as quickly as possible. So that's kind of, um, uh, the, the experience that we've had specifically with Smarking. Um, we also have other um, other kind of interesting uh, relationships with the city. So we we, for example, run the uh, the uh, parking for the Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is a huge uh, public health trust here in the city of Miami. Uh, mm -hmm. So they have five garages, another six or seven surface lots, uh, and obviously, like we sent our staff home on the 19th. Uh, but the hospital doesn't get to do that. Uh, and so um, so our, our hospital staff is still there. They're still manning the garages. And, and that's led to, you know, to, to its own set of challenges. So, um, so that's kind of our, our perspective right now. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, yeah, I think to your point, a lot of uh, people outside of the parking world wouldn't know how important parking is, especially when it comes to the revenue standpoint to the city. A lot of projects are funded by parking, actually. So I would say... Um, this is also uh, important for everybody to know that actually uh, what parking is offering to the city and what we're doing here is absolutely very critical, especially with this new reality um, we'll talk about uh, that I think a lot of people in the industry would love to learn uh, from you about your perspectives on that as well uh, from operations to uh, when it comes to revenue implications and so on. So with that being said, again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, with us today. We'll get into the um, first uh, uh, section of the discussion, the new reality. Um, before we um, uh, 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 get into the details of each city, uh, I'd love to quickly share um, with everyone uh, through the screen on um, what we have observed. Now, we have a daily market watch uh, uh, for um, about 500 off-street locations. Um, 400 open service lots and about 500 on-street blocks uh, in terms of before and after uh, COVID-19 pandemic, what we're observing uh, for different kind of parking across the country. So the first uh, set of uh, uh, graph you're seeing here is, we observed that for commuter parking, mostly off-street locations, the activity before and after you can see year over year, before we were actually doing much better from a business standpoint, more people are parking and going to the parking locations and after, um, up until yesterday, uh, we're looking at uh, relatively about 25% of uh, volume compared to the same time period last year. But the good news is, it looks like it stabilized. The first week had dropped really quickly. Um, sorry, the, um, <clears throat> it stabilized at about 25% when it comes to commuter parking. This is what we're um, seeing right now across the board. We'd love to have panelists' input on what they're seeing on their end. And now when it comes to visitor parking or transient parking, this is uh, primarily the off-street locations when it comes to transient side, looks like the volume drop is more significant as well as the revenue. It's in the range of five to 10% of what we had last year during this time period. And mm -hmm. there is a little bit of variation um, uh, uh, from uh, the weekdays, Mondays to, to the weekends. Um, we're also seeing that for on-street parking, before and after, before a lot of times we're having year over year increase uh, just shy of 20%, which is fantastic. Business is growing. But uh, after right now, uh, we're looking at just about 10% of the volume we had before uh, yeah. from revenue to activities. And the daily peak occupancy, it's a clear 
uh, I'd say change before and after from what we're seeing. This is on street, and same goes with off street. Um, so a side note, if you're interested in learning more about the cross-board cancer stats, feel free to go to Smarty's website, and we have a blog published on a daily basis to, um, talking about the high-level stats. But with that being the um, high-level observation, panelists, I would love to um, this time start with um, uh, Mr. Espinosa from uh, Miami. What is this, what you're seeing in Miami as well? What is kind of sort of, a, what is your new reality? And how does that impact your day-to-day? Yeah, so our reality is, um, so w- one of the things to understand about the, the Miami Parking Authority, we are, uh, a lot of what we run are, are, are the, the, the very um, uh, high density uh, areas in the city. Uh, and obviously, the, you know, the traffic has, has just completely disappeared uh, from there, downtown Miami, uh, the entertainment districts, Coconut Grove, Linwood, uh, the design district, all even the, the entire financial district, it, you know, all, it, it, it's all closed. So, in terms of in terms of revenue and and uh, uh, and transactions and all that, we're seeing approximately an 85% decline, kind of across the board. Um, one of the things that, that that we learned a long time ago uh, by doing a couple of studies and actually looking at studies from San Francisco was was another kind of interesting thing. So um, you will tend to see higher compliance rates in places that are that are more highly occupied. And so even if we have people still coming in and using our resources, they are less likely to pay for parking uh, simply because there's fewer people around. So that's, that's I think, so, something that started happening early on. Uh, and then uh, finally on the 19th, the, the week before the 19th, uh, Dade County Schools said, hey, listen, you know, we're sending all the kids home. Uh, and then there immediately we just started seeing uh, just a major drop off in transactions. Uh, and then once we sent our staff home the following Thursday, um, you know, at that point, we even just announced, listen, we are not uh, enforcing paid parking anymore. So it's it's technically not free. Uh, there's some bond issues involved with that where we cannot give away uh, parking. But if we're not enforcing it, then you, know, you can kind of interpret that as you will. Um, I mean, we are enforcing uh, violations and that type of stuff, but we're not, um, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, parking in ADA spots and, and things like that, uh, but but we're not enforcing paid parking right now. Um, and then in terms of just like the day-to-day operations, most of the staff is home, most people are working remotely. Um, and so we're just kind of trying to weather the storm here and and, uh, uh, and see what, you know, where it goes. We've closed one of our garages. We've had to leave three of our garages open. Uh, two of them have residential uh, components to them, so we don't really have the option of closing those. Um, and then one of them has kind of a business condo uh, thing going on in the in the um, uh, in the building where we actually have owners of the building uh, that, uh, you know, of offices in the buildings that have said that they wanted to, to stay open or be able to access their offices. So we had to leave uh, that garage open as well. Um, so that, that's kind of our reality right now. Right now, what we're trying to do is kind of take a look at our staffing levels. Um, so far, we've kept everybody on. We've cut schedules. Um, and and then you know we're, we're just kind of playing it by ear here, see how quickly we can get through the storm. Uh, obviously, we don't want to you know we don't want to impact our employees, uh, but depending on how long this goes, we may not we may not have a choice. So, but none of those decisions have been made. Got it, got it. So essentially, watch it on a daily basis. On one hand, uh, not a cookie cutter when it comes to parking policy, but really try working with this new reality. On the other hand, protect the employees. Uh, what all you guys have is kind of sort of a high level, as I'm hearing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Got it. Wonderful. Um, Rami and Holt, you guys wanted to comment on from the city of Houston, what is the new reality? Well, currently, um, we're pretty much. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I was. I'm sorry. I was mute. We're pretty much. I apologize. Amy. Um. So I was, I was just going to say, for us, uh, the reality mimics uh, what Henry just mentioned. A lot of businesses are closed. Downtown is extremely slow. Um, there are a few restaurants that are open, but obviously they're all just, uh, you know, pick up and go. Um, all the entertainment venues are closed. Um, I believe parks are open, but obviously they're asking people to exercise social distancing and what have you. But overall, uh, I, you know, the numbers that we're looking at, we're looking at decreases since this COVID-19 started 
hitting the city and the city began issuing uh, stay at home orders and stuff, we're looking at anywhere between uh, 60 to 70 percent drop in, in overall um, revenue and uh, just volume of transactions. And so obviously that, that you know, that's going to have a, a big impact on our revenue budgets. We are a revenue generating fund, so we are, we're obviously expected to meet our, um, you know, goals every year. But this year is obviously because of this virus situation, that's going to be very difficult to do. Um, as far as our employees are concerned, um, uh, some are working from home. Some are continuing to come into the office. Um, we're trying to space out people as much as possible, again, just to do the social distancing correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far, everybody on staff is still on staff. We're trying to keep them as busy as possible, um, you know, catching up on all things, essentially, that we never really had time for until this hit, and uh, things of that nature. But as far as operationally, it's, it's um, you know, just like Henry said, it's extremely slow um, mm -hmm. volume going on on the streets outside. Yep, I see. Thank you, Rami and Hol. And uh, Mr. Sermon from C uh, City of Santa Monica, uh, can you share with us your new reality and how does this shift your priorities? I think I think similar to what Henry Espinosa began with is that you know once we started noticing that uh, things were indeed getting um, um, uh, increasing in severity uh, toward the first week in March, we decided to pivot. Uh, we worked very closely with our neighboring cities, including the mayor of Los Angeles and, and our mayor here in Santa Monica. To figure out what it is that we can support, how do we need to cut back, uh, what role does each one of the essential services um, take, including nominating parking as an essential service, and so we came together. Um, when we realized that we would have to close the beach access, uh, that, that's you know basically half of our operation, um, we, we complied with that request, we immediately closed down the facilities, we stopped taking money at these locations, but in essence, um, you know, we still have to staff them because uh, there will be scoff laws that attempt to park and then go do their business at the beach and such. So we're, we're providing staffing. Um, State of California enacted some uh, emergency response measures that allow us to claim against future, hopefully, federal uh, subsidies for a COVID-19 response. So we're declaring our parking staff as essential. They're working to provide um, uh, as ambassador service on the beach to gently remind people that they shouldn't be there and they have to go back home. Even if they're not collecting money, at least they're there providing a public service. Um, in the downtown, we've pivoted a little separately. Uh, many of our restaurants have gone to takeout operations. And so we've seen an, a tremendous increase in either individuals pre-ordering their food and taking it out by, by coming to the curbside and having restaurant staff bring it out to them, or you know the DoorDash and, and Uber Eats folks just blossoming overnight and uh, taking over curbsides. What we've done to facilitate that is we've designated special curbside access so that folks that are uh, waiting for an order can legitimately park and then somehow signal that they're available for pickups. We've um, uh, changed our downtown parking operations where, uh, as, as, as Henry also alluded, our monthly parkers are evaporated. There's no one coming on a regular basis to downtown, but we still have a lot of visitors that are parking off street, collecting their food or their alcohol or, or any of the other interesting dispensaries that we have here in California, um, and then going about their business. Uh, we've um, recognized that some of these essential employees, these cooks, these janitors, these dishwashers don't make a lot of money to begin with. So instead of reselling them a monthly pass, which can cost $220 a month here in Santa Monica, we've introduced uh, part-time pricing. We cannot receive their money or their transactions through our customer service windows, but we are instructing how they can do this online or how they can mail us a check by US mail. And then we certify and overnight the uh, uh, parking hang tags or other validation instruments to them uh, uh, by mail. So we're we're pivoting. The, the new reality is I wish I had 10 more accountants than I had before or, or uh, cashiers, but um, we're, we're making do with that. Um, the only other area that uh, we've been um, successful in doing with our city manager is uh, showing them how important it is to have good data. Even with anywhere from 5 to 20% occupancies, 
uh, instructing them the value of having legitimate data available at our fingertips is has been tremendous. Um, we're now showing that uh, with this kind of an emergency, our baselines are are you know even even with this emergency. In other words, I know that my parking facilities are getting at least five percent traffic, and uh, we're right sizing appropriately, including uh, stepping up patrols uh, that the police department does for us. Some of the locations that we've had to close, uh, we've seen upticks in um, you know the unhoused taking over these facilities. And so um, if we see activity where someone might try to move in a vehicle illegally, um, the sensors information pick it up. Uh, we recognize that they didn't complete a transaction. Uh, we notify the police department and they are enforcing. Um, we are still collecting coins from our meters and, and credit card transactions, I should say, from our parking meters. And we are still enforcing for citations. Uh, it's been pretty clear to us that unless we create the turnover at the curb, we're quickly going to get overwhelmed with people parking and not moving their cars, and then some of those street side uh, uh, the businesses, depending on the takeaway, will will suffer. So we're still doing that. Uh, the only concession that we've had is that we have a, a a large residential permit parking program all over town. We've decided to suspend uh, the uh, citations associated with not moving your car in a neighborhood street for more than 72 hours. So that. That is the one concession we've made in the, at the moment, but um, you know it's it's uh, it's been a, a, a very uh, difficult time. Um, luckily, it's helped a lot that we have the data at our fingertips to justify uh, what we need to do. I'll leave wow. it at that. That yeah. is amazing. So, in, and, and if, I could yeah. just, if I could just refer to something that that, that Herney, uh mentioned there about uh, the the huge uptick in uh, delivery. Uh, services yeah. like Uber and, and you know, Uber Eats and, and DoorDash and these, these, these kinds of places. So we've actually uh, created loading zones specifically for that where it's free to park. Um, that was kind of a, a, an interesting thing that, that, uh, that we did uh, fairly, fairly early on. And then also referencing your, 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 um, uh, what you mentioned in terms of having data uh, available too quickly. Look, all the decisions that we're making you know, at some point you're going to have to tell somebody why you made that decision, yes. and and having that data available to you is, you know, I said, look, you know, we we cut back on staff because we're down 85% on on our transactions. I mean, there's there's no arguing with that. So, um, you know, for for, for private organizations, I, I I don't I don't really know uh, what the dynamics are so much, but when you start talking about you know municipal entities where there's politics involved and that type of thing. Um, you not only need the data to make good decisions, but also to defend those decisions. So uh, that's something that's been a godsend for us. Thank you. So it sounds like um, <clears throat> there is new dynamics when it comes to what uh, citizens would need. On one hand, there's food delivery. The merchants are still relying on uh, this kind of services to survive through this unique time period. So uh, when it comes to parking, one of the priorities to make sure these things are being facilitated, the turnover rate is being enabled and uh, to a certain extent when it comes to these needs from both the consumer side as well as the businesses it, it is important to, to provide the, the continued parking services to ensure that that, that the uh, turnover is happening on the mm -hmm. other hand it sounds like it's not a, a cookie cutter that uh, it's really i call this kind of sort of surgical parking operations in a way that <laughs> yes we would work with the new reality but we need to look closely at what is needed to on one hand create that social distancing protect the employees but also sounds like we should not just go blind eyes with the revenue implication as well as what really the citizens and the businesses uh, need versus just, okay, shut down everything all for free. And instead of doing that, it, it's important to look closely and then understand what's happening and then uh, work with proactively with the new reality is kind of sort of the spirit here. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you all very much. So then um, when it comes, so it, obviously everybody touched a little bit on when it comes to parking rates, uh, kind of sort of enforcement policies, and how to operate in this new era. If we go just one level deeper into that, when it comes to um, rates, enforcement uh, policies, and everything in this short term, um, based off of what we just talked about, uh, could the panelists share a little bit more on um, what is what is what is the line of thinking over there? What are how do you decide on these things? Uh, besides what, what, what we just talked about, uh, if there's any new comments on uh, rates and enforcement policies and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and anyone, please, yeah, jump in. 
Yeah, I, I'm happy to start in, and 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 I'm sure that Houston and Miami uh, do it completely different. Um, because we're a coastal city, and and it's California, um, we have a very strong California Coastal Commission that number one wants to guarantee access to anyone who wants to access the beaches. And before we can even consider raising rates, we have to produce justifiable data that says that any pricing that we introduce in Santa Monica, both at the curbside or off street, is um, carefully researched so that we're not considered to be gouging the customer and that we are um, not limiting, let's say a typical family of four driving to the beach um, from, from reaching that access. Um, without the smarking data and, and without being able to list year over year transactional information, I don't think that we would have received any uh, coastal uh, permits to, to operate our facilities with any kind of rate changes. So I just add, it, add that in there. Uh, we have a regulatory agency that watches us very carefully. Uh, they've accepted the fact that we've aggregated all of our data. Uh, we've gone back over four years of data, even though um, that was an expensive venture. Um, and can at the basically uh, the better part of an afternoon show across our entire portfolio how we price so that we're not you know shooing people away involuntarily. Um, we do also use that data as we benchmark with our other partners, the uh, the bus company, the local big blue bus company, um, uh, shared mobility users that uh, provide uh, bicycle services here in Santa Monica, so that we're indexing our pricing. So that, in fact, if a family of four wanted to take a train trip into downtown Santa Monica, um, we wouldn't necessarily make it cheaper for them to drive and park. It would be about neutral, so that we are giving people incentives to consider public transit. Um, the other part of that discussion is that before we had the smarking platform, uh, it was pretty easy for the city council to decide at whim whether something should be free or not. Um, our city manager asked us to explore how to get our data in such a way such that the city council could receive better information when making these decisions. Um, when we decided that you know, merely doing sensor counts and collecting occupancy information wasn't enough, but to actually go toward a transactions-based system, uh, Smarking came out on top for that. Uh, we're able to show folks not only occupancy forecasts, but you know what our sessions and durations are. I can tell you that the majority of our downtown visitors stay for three and a half hours or less and spend about five dollars. And if I can tell the city council that uh, on any given summer month we have you know 14,000 people a day doing this, spending five dollars each, that that starts to make sense to the city um, leaders. They uh, because we receive the money and deposit it into the general fund. Um, it's a key indicator. We we're the number one generator uh, uh, in Santa Monica's daily revenue, way above the hotel and occupancy taxes, certainly um, you know, getting up there on par with our county property tax uh, uh, proceeds as well. So um, that, that story of being able to tell folks, you know, um, don't give it away for free, but here's the tools that let you price it appropriately have been very important to us. Thank you, thank you, Harry. Any other comments on uh, kind of sort of before and uh, after the COVID-19, uh, these two different <laughs> worlds, um, when it comes to parking rates and enforcement policies and so on. Um, if not, we can move into the next uh, section of discussion on how are we thinking about the replanning, the recovery? What are the things um, on everyone's mind today uh, when it comes to short term, we're, we're, we're hoping for a medical inflection point to come in soon, uh, but longer term toward the end of the year, how are we thinking about the next steps? Um, before we jump into that, any other comments on, on, on the previous topic? Yeah, this is Rami with uh, City of Houston. I just wanted to mention or add that um, just like other cities, we've actually switched to more of an um, ambassadorial rule where we're just enforcing safety violations. So if something is really egregious and it poses a safety to the public, we will definitely enforce it and issue a citation for it. But otherwise, we've relaxed enforcement, obviously, around the city. Um, and, and some of our folks are actually helping out with other essential duties around the city as we deal with this uh, virus situation. So we've actually deployed some of our enforcement officers to other departments to help out with some essential functions that the city is trying to carry out during this period. Got it. 
Got it. So create that flexibility for citizens when it comes to, you know, things like extended stay or so to give people that benefit. But at the same time, definitely enforce the safety related items uh, is kind of sort of the high level. OK. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So then um, when it comes to we're all hoping for toward the end of this month, possibly coming in the middle of May, things may start picking up and look differently. And obviously, it's always important to plan ahead and to stay ahead of the curve. What are some of the thoughts uh, the panelists have today uh, within your day-to-day, uh, -day with your uh, scope of responsibilities in terms of the next phase? How, how, are we, how are we thinking about, one, the long-term impact of COVID-19 toward the end of the year? And two, what are the things that you're thinking about um, uh, 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 right now to, to plan for that? Um, Anyone feel uh, to answer? Uh, please feel to uh, feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll start. Uh, so we're obviously very concerned. Uh, Miami's a tourist city, right? Um, the three biggest cruise lines in the world, uh, uh, you know, uh, tourists get off the boats and and uh, and they walk around downtown Miami. So um, even if the rest of the economy recovers relatively quickly, I think the tourism uh, is going to take a substantially longer time uh, to recovery uh, to recover, particularly the cruise industry. They, they've um, they've received a lot of bad press. Um, you know, some of it deserves, some of it not. But the point is that um, even if everything else, you know, if banking comes back very quickly, that's great. But the tourism is going to have a major impact on us for the long term. Uh, any slowdown in the economy may have an impact on us for long term. Personally, I'm 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 uh, I'm very curious to see what the impact of having everybody work at home will be, uh, because companies that had never even considered it may start saying, well, you know what, we did it during this crisis, and you know we can we can maybe you know make it easier for our uh, employees to you know to avoid that one or two hour commute uh, in the morning if they work maybe just one day out of the week. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they don't come down to the office. So we may see that type of thing, which will obviously uh, reduce demand for parking in, in, in the areas that we um, uh, that we manage the downtown area, the financial district, the design district, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, and then, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the places where are, are more entertainment based, I think those are going to probably bounce back pretty quickly. Uh, but again, a, a large part, a large part of our uh, operation, uh, you know, and, and just the, the city in general runs on tourism. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would tend to agree with a lot of what Henry just uh, described. I, I think a lot of us are wondering what's going to happen with this long term as far as the whole work from home situation. Some people are obviously apprehensive about it. They don't know how it's like. They've never tried it before. But if it works and it works for some people in some instances, um, I wonder what will happen once things actually get back to quote normal. Um, what will be the new normal? Will it be a combination of what we see now versus and, and you know a little bit of what we had before, or or what will it be like? That's definitely a burning question. Uh, for us, uh, this is obviously going to have you know huge fiscal impact on us from a revenue standpoint. The longer it goes on, the more concerned uh, we are. Um, Houston, you know, is is not a top destination for tourists, but we have a lot of entertainment venues. Um, we have a lot of sports teams. Uh, downtown has three major venues for sports, and they're all obviously shut down because the leagues uh, and the seasons have not started and or you know are are suspended. And so the longer that goes on, uh, the more the more impact that's going to have on on uh, the businesses that are in the area here and and the parkers are coming in to attend these venues and attend these events um so you know hopefully this is over uh before too long but obviously like henry said the longer it goes on the more concerned we are definitely yeah. i'll add that uh, yeah we're we're going to come to some very sober realizations i i think that we're going to be exploring a new normal where you may not have, you know, single driver uh, vehicles much anymore, and and people will be looking at teleworking, maybe even just carpooling, just to you know, kind of save money moving forward. Uh, frankly, we're working with 
everyone we we know that has a stake in this the hotel industry is the event activation folks our own uh, you know forecast analysts to figure out what that new equilibrium might be we're making assumptions that maybe we start to um, hit apex and start to plan toward recovery uh, after April 30th maybe after June 30th maybe even after August 30th or further and so um, the more we we delay, obviously, the the less parking revenue we can count on. But but some things we do know. Uh, we know that eventually this will go away, and we're going to concentrate efforts. Um, we'll probably see a lot of folks drive to the beach just to be able to you know walk with their kids and get some fresh ocean air. Uh, so we're probably going to institute things like flat rates uh, at the beach so that we're not timing people. So if they get here and we can accommodate them, they can stay here as long as they like. Um, we're looking at how to readjust our, our meters uh, on the curbside so that you know maybe we need to lower them or, or raise them for city council action so that we can you know reintroduce folks to our parking garages and, and get them in there a little more and reactivate them. Uh, the biggest hassle, of course, is that we're um, you know had to reduce the size of the forces. We 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 have to um, um, based the amount of staff we need based on the amount of revenue collection that we do. And, and unfortunately, uh, during this time, we had to make some very difficult decisions. Uh, uh, and, and it's gonna take time to get these folks back. Uh, we're, we're gonna have to figure out what facilities we can open once we're on the, on the, uh, on the, on the recovery side and uh, where we can bring people back to, to legitimate jobs. I like the fact I heard from uh, Miami and Houston that you know they're repurposing staff as ambassadors and others, and and that's that's really noble. Um, to the extent that we can do that as well, including them, you know, having folks work emergency operations lines or customer call centers, uh, we're trying. But but frankly, you know, we're 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 cost cutting, and and there will be you know some lag time before we can start up again and and, and get into full mode, whatever that is. Um, and not, but, yeah. but we're exploring what we can do. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like really that on one hand, we need to be um, to a certain extent honest with ourselves that not only the new reality is right now, but there will be a new reality in in upcoming months toward the end of the year or even coming into next year that uh, it will be different. Uh, we we'll, uh, by no by no means we can predict how the recovery is going to go, but. This thing will go away, but the new reality will still be different from what we had before. And because of that, creativity would have to be in place when it comes to how do we curb the expenses? How do we repurpose the facilities? How do we repurpose our um, the staff? And when it comes to um, how to create new opportunities to really capture certain uh, uh, revenue or certain uh, um, uh, to, to provide certain pro uh, uh, services to different uh, business uh, um, scenarios or uh, use cases for consumers and businesses is kind of sort of the high level takeaway. It'll be new, it'll be different, and we got to just go creative when it comes to all of these things. It's yes. kind of sort of the high level. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all very much. Now then, when it comes to um, some thoughts on your recommendations to professionals uh, in the municipality world, in the community of parking, in the coming days, months, and weeks, um, what would that be as kind of sort of the third part of our uh, panel part of the discussion and then we'll open the uh, floor to the audience. Now, what are some of the recommendations you would provide to the peers? And on the other hand, uh, from a silver lining standpoint, what are the potential opportunities? Are there any potential opportunities out of this crisis? And what are the things that you are seeing um, as, as kind of, sort of silver lining opportunities? Okay. Um, well, from my perspective, one of the things that, 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 that we're doing uh, is we're trying, right now we're trying to collect as much data as possible, uh, even yes. though, you know, our numbers are, are way down. Um, one of the things that, that's absolutely critical for us is whenever we make any kind of changes to, uh, to the way that we operate, be it because of this uh, pandemic or because the rates changed or because uh, a new building went up, uh, we try to track that as much as possible so that at some point down the line, we go back and look at the data. Um, we can say, hey, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic had this level of impact on our mm -hmm. revenue, but there may have been other things at play as well. And again, this pandemic is unprecedented. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, 
you know, you, you, if you look at the charts, it's pretty clear that it's, it's the driving factor uh, right now, but it's always important to collect as much data as possible, uh, even on, on stuff that's not even directly related to the transactions. You know, how many officers did you have on the street at, at, in, in any given day? Uh, and how is that driving your revenue? How is that driving your compliance? Uh, so again, even if the even if, uh, if transactions are very low right now, one of the things that we're trying to do is still continue to get, capture as much data as possible, you know, to see the effects of all the different variables on both compliance and and on revenue. Mm -hmm. Right. If if I can jump in on on Henry's coattails, um, one of the things as managers that we've been asked to do is to find out where we can cut, cut, cost cut further. Um, so, you know, we can increase the wait times at our call centers by reducing the amount of staff there. We, we can reduce the number of deployed cashiers or, or uh, ticket takers at other locations. But, uh, you know, frankly, when I'm asked to reduce the size of my citations budget or my parking meter repair crew or things like that, um, you know, you look at those and see where you can trim. Frankly, the one area where I was asked, can I cut my, you know, data collection budget? And I said, no, absolutely not. This is the time you want to invest in your data because uh, when when you need to pivot, you can start to show people where you need to spend the greatest effort. Um, it's 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 been you know one of those opportunities where someone from the outside looking into my operations might say, well, you know, what's this data business? And I'm telling them it's it's the entire roadmap. I mean, without this, I'd be blind and I wouldn't know where to explore next. I'll just throw that out there. Thank you, thank you, Henry. Any comments on your end, Rami and Holt? Yeah. yeah, I think for us, it's again, it's the same uh, same stuff. Uh, we're trying to collect as much data as we can. Uh, we're, um, I think, in a sense, we're all trying to make a uh, sense of where this is going to go. Uh, maybe you know, listen to uh, the experts and figure out how long it might go on, and start predicting and putting together models for you know maybe potential revenue losses and what will that mean for our operation for the rest of this fiscal year plus the coming fiscal year um you know we're in the middle of our fiscal year now we're actually we've got a couple of months left in it um, but then we have a new one that's starting on july 1st what do we do with that one we've already had some numbers uh, in place for the new budget year how will that now look based on this new reality um so i'm sure all these questions you know the city right now as, as you know as it is with all other places in uh, around the world really we're trying to just deal with this day in and day out but i'm sure at some point in time uh we will have to sit down and make some hard decisions and, and some fiscal decisions about how do we move forward from this got it got it so it's really that Let's keep a track of things. Let's not lose sight of what is really happening and have a quantitative understanding. Uh, and later on, we can look back at the same time. We can really use this information to direct the next steps of, okay, let's model a lot of different scenarios of recovery and then see where the uh, uh, new reality would, would, would be at and uh, then go from there to essentially um, give us guidance and really understand, uh, start, start with understanding what is happening and what to expect and then adjust the operations and go from there. Okay, thank you all very much, panelists. Now, with a uh, little bit more time uh, left on our hand, uh, we'd like to open up the uh, floor to the audience, and uh, with, with any questions coming in, uh, we'll pick the brain of the panelists and then see uh, if we can, um, um, if we could have your insights on. So, um, we got uh, a couple questions. Now, the first one is, what are the um, panelists' opinion of the effect of a uh, COVID-19, once we all began to ramp back up to normal operations. I understand everybody touched on that uh, uh, briefly already, but if there are expanded uh, uh, thoughts, comments, please jump in here. And this is Mark, uh, Mark Lyons uh, uh, um, from the audience. Um, I'll what? start first mm -hmm. um, from Santa Monica. I mean, you know, when frankly, when you lay people off, you lay them off. They, you give them their whole package and off they go. Now we have to rehire, and that takes time. Uh, hopefully, we can find the same people and bring them back. But you know, you're going to go through all of the HR reviews. You're going to be doing all the required testing. Um, it's you know something that's hard to do at the onset, and even harder to do in the callbacks. So planning how you're going to staff up if you have to reduce forces. Uh, the other part of that is getting your communications out. Um, 
there's going to be a lot of folks that are not going to be pleased to have to pay for their parking if they had it temporarily suspended. So you've got to get your messaging campaign out there early so that people receive the message in, in a good form. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So communicate, over communicate early on. Yes. Yeah, that's that, that that's a great point because there's always the uh, uh, the concept of you know too soon, right? Yes. Uh, when is it too <laughs> soon to start to start charging for parking again, right? Um, you know, you do have to be sensitive that 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 not only our staff that may have been laid off or whatever, but you know, many many uh, uh, workers have lost their jobs. They're they're you know they're, they they may be behind on their mortgages and that kind of stuff. So um, you know, th those are those are some questions that are going to require some serious scrutiny. Um, just and just add one other thing. Um, obviously, forecasting is very important. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on with uh, with with uh, Smarting is literally developing a forecasting model where we can yes. say, well, you know, like um, a Herney might have one set of assumptions about how quickly their uh, market is going to rebound. We're working with under different assumptions because we have different variables at play, but we can plug all that stuff in and say. Look, you know, this is our best case scenario. This is our worst case scenario for six months down the line, nine, nine months down the line, a you know, year or whatever. So that, that's a, that's another one of the things that's absolutely critical right now. Um, yeah, for for Houston, I, I think communication is a big, big, big key. Um, in situations like this, I think um, all of us would agree that uh, maybe over communication is better than under communication. <laughs> I'd rather know everything that I need and plus. Uh, than uh, than less than what I need to know. So I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. So we've been uh, trying to be very communicative with our staff. Uh, we uh, have you know daily uh, uh, virtual calls now, obviously, and uh, just to keep the staff updated on what's going on. Um, you know, the mayor here holds a, a daily news conference, update the city on what's going on, uh, as I'm sure is happening across the nation. And another part is the, the forecasting is also very important. So we're actually in the middle of, you know, again, keeping track of this and the magnitude of impact that it's having on us. But also, uh, where, where is this going to go? What do we, uh, you know, if this lasts for another two weeks, what do, what the numbers look like? If it lasts for a month, if it lasts for a couple months. I, I read some reports that some people are predicting that this is going to go on until August, September. Mm -hmm. Um, what what is what do the numbers and the forecasting look like uh, for you know for our revenue budget at that point and what kind of impact is that going to have? So and of course and everything that we do here um, affects the city's bottom line, if you will, and, um, and and so you know us and other departments in the city that generate revenue for the city are obviously in the same boat. We're all trying to figure out where are we going to go um, and how will this affect um, operations in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, second question from the same um, uh, 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 attendee, uh, Mark Lines. Has anyone considered providing service workers free parking permits for limited period of time? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry. Right, so the question is, has anyone considered providing uh, service workers free parking permits uh, for a limited time? For a limited period of time. So, so that that kind of idea is, has been kicked around. Uh, again, we have some limitations on the ability to provide free parking, just you know, for legal reasons. So, different organizations may have different restrictions there. So, but mm -hmm. but we are not allowed to kind of give away parking just by by statute. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I I will add that you know our our city council um, can choose to do whatever they wish to do. But you know we've been very lucky that they do consult with us first. Um, similar to what Mr. Espinosa has, you know we're paying off parking authority bonds, and um, we need to legitimize every every uh, freebie that we give away, and and that's not easily done. Um, and having said that, you know um, providing free parking, as as Dr. Shoup has taught us, is not free. Um, you still need to put the lights on. You st you still have to make sure the public restrooms work. You still have to provide your ambassadors. You still have to provide your machines, um, your your cleanliness issues, and uh, there's an induced cost. Uh, the last thing I want to do is offer free parking with no lights on, and then discover that these volunteers and service workers are now exposed to dangers that they that we hadn't anticipated. 
um, we 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 need to let people know that you know we we may not necessarily um, exclusively sell you a 30-day month pass, but maybe we'll sell you an 18-day or an 11-day pass, just to be flexible. But yeah. but it's not free. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, any comments from Remy and Holt? Um, it, it's the same for us. We have not changed, you know, any of the rules as far as uh, paid parking or anything like that. Um, so it's, there's still an expense to, uh, to to purchase these things, and if you need a permit or what have you, there's still an expense for it. Uh, but obviously, we we try to be as flexible as possible with people considering the situation. But yeah, there's no there are no freebies. Right, right. So essentially, pay attention to legality. Uh, restrictions and make sure that uh, everything is really thought through versus just uh, uh, go free for the sake of going free, uh, mm -hmm. but really make sure all aspects are considered, uh, thought out, and then to the maximum possible extent create flex uh, flexibilities for citizens is kind of sort of the direction. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. A uh, question from uh, Fatah Wudarison. Um, how does marketing works for municipalities and so on and so forth? Does marketing? So this is a very market sp specific question. We'll, we'll make sure to get back to you, uh, Fatou, and uh, we'll, we'll just uh, answer more of the question. Let the panelists answer more questions related to the topic, but we'll make sure to get back to you on that. Um, question uh, from David Weber to any of the panelists: What are their thoughts on el eliminating on-street parking in dense city centers? I believe there is more than enough off-street parking to offset losing on-street spaces in urban centers. The lanes could be used for mobility lanes, deliveries, larger walkways. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start only because mobility is a key word here in Santa Monica. We're, we're, we're all about getting you out of your single use car and you know getting on a bike or a bus or the train uh, or, or walking, heaven forbid. Uh, so um, having said that, I would strongly caution anyone exploring just uh, repurposing the curb because you need to look at your land use plans. You need to talk to your chamber of commerce. You need to work with the delivery companies because um, you know curbside parking is is a very um, important and well understood resource that we can't just magic away. Um, you know we we foresee that even if the parking meter is no longer there in ten years, there will still be a way of monetizing the curb. And it doesn't matter if you're a five minute Federal Express delivery, or a 10-minute DoorDash pickup, or even a, a person dashing into their local bank to withdraw money, um, you're, you're going to still have to monetize the curb and provide some sort of timed uh, parking experience at that curb. Um, you know, we we strongly agree that you know probably the best use of the curb is for bus lanes because they carry the most people and move the most people. But you know, it's going to have to be a, a, a very carefully thought out plan involving all your stakeholders and your 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 basically your legal instrument for running your city that is your land use plan wonderful yeah I'll, I'll, I'll let go I'll, I'll let go that idea I mean um, it, you know it, it, on, on the face of it it seems to make a lot of sense to say hey you know let's let's get rid of the on-street parking and, and move everybody to you know to off street but FedEx isn't going to move to off street uh, uber isn't going to move to off street so what we're seeing is actually a lot more pressure on the curb than we've ever had before, right? So even if we were to say, well, listen, you know, and, and actually one of the challenges that we're going through right now is figuring out how we're going to manage the increased demand for the curb, um, you know, creating special programs for deliveries for, uh, you know, again, in the last 10 years, obviously things like, you know, Amazon deliveries have skyrocketed, right? Um, and so, uh, so we're just seeing a lot more demand for it right now. It's we, we we've actually had um, a couple of areas in the city where they've removed um, they've removed the on-street parking. Um, there's a major uh, major thorough, uh, thoroughfare down here called Flagler that uh, you know the plan was to to eliminate all of it and, uh, and, and set up essentially valet parking uh, for many of uh, many of those areas. So. That type of thing is already underway, um, but again, you know, we, we need to be very, very careful because, um, again, off-street parking will not meet all of the needs of the new economy. So it's really a holistic mobility cancer landscape that we're working toward, and um, on-street curbs will be one part of the solution, but we got to have comprehensive plans. While it is pretty clear that uh, there are better ways of using just the curb space just for parking, but a lot more beyond that. 
is kind of sort of like high level. Wonderful. So I want to be mindful of everybody's time. And we do have a lot more questions from Brian Spear, Adam Reppel, Michael Riscano, and uh, Amber Evans. A lot of other uh, uh, attendees gave us very uh, 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 a lot of questions. We'll make sure to uh, sum up all of these questions for panelists. I want to ask for your help to answer, and we'll shall, uh, share your insights with the entire audience. Um, but yeah, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, we hit the 2 o'clock <laughs> mark already. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, panelists. This is amazing. This is very concrete substance. And I'm sure this would really help a lot of uh, uh, peers in industry to uh, think about the, the in this new reality and then plan for the next. So yeah. thank you all very much. And thank you all the um, attendees for uh, joining us today. Uh, we'll make sure to send out the recap. Thanks for having us, Wen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Everyone stay safe. Bye-bye.